Hello, everybody. Welcome on this beautiful April um, to a great new future of plastics. Uh, this is our in celebration of Earth Day, Earth Week, Earth Month. We are bringing this wonderful program to you um, with two great scientists, as usual, Aaron Hall and Jeremy Demarteau. Um, of course, as usual, first things first, I am going to go ahead and do a land acknowledgement if you do not mind. So we recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun ter territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. The land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of Alameda County. This land, what, oh, excuse me, every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So again, thank you so much for allowing me to make that land acknowledgement. I am Dion Rossiter, I haven't even said that, the Executive Director of Science at Cal, the one half of this amazing Midday Science Cafe program. In 2008, Science at Cal was envisioned as a unifying effort to raise public awareness and understanding and appreciation of scientific research at UC Berkeley. To realize this vision, we engage the vast Berkeley STEM community as science communicators and foster creative collaborations among campus and community-based uh, groups who share our commitment in, to equity and inclusion in STEM education and STEM careers, one of which being Berkeley Lab. Science at Cal connects, uh, oh, excuse me, um, connects the STEM researchers with diverse community groups of all ages and backgrounds for science engagement and learning, accessibility, inclusiveness, and creativity are hallmarks of Science at Cal events, which tens of thousands of people um, participate in annually. Throughout the year, Science at Cal presents ongoing free outreach programs in STEM and other disciplines. We help promote other groups related efforts and we create new programs and initiatives at Berkeley and within the community. The broad scope of activities has made Science at Cal's dynamic works on and off campus reliable and valuable. Um, I'm now going to hand things over. Well, just before I hand things over to Jen Tang from Berkeley Lab, I do want to say this program will be recorded and it will appear online at the, at the end of the event. Also, this, uh, this presentation, you can find transcripts or closed captioning to the presentation in the Zoom, um, in, in your Zoom kind of sphere. There should be three buttons and you can click the three buttons at the bottom and ask for closed captioning um, if you haven't been asked already. Uh, and last but not least, I will hand things over to De Jen Tang to introduce Berkeley Lab. Thanks so much, Dee. Uh, as Dee mentioned, I am at Berkeley Lab. I'm the Director of Community Relations at the lab. And for those who aren't familiar, uh, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 US Department of Energy national laboratories across the country. We are supported by the Department of Energy's Office of Science, and we're managed by the University of California. And all of the research we conduct at the lab is unclassified. Now, since our founding in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, we've been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking answers to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. And today, Berkeley Lab employees work together to develop meaningful scientific solutions to the world's most intractable energy and environmental challenges, help train the next generation of scientists and engineers, and ensure that those things happen in a manner that benefits everyone. Our main campus is located in the Berkeley Hills and our close ties to the UC system create a really unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. A number of the lab's researchers are affiliated with one of the UC campuses, either as students, postdocs, or professors who have joint appointments at the lab. And we're fortunate to have an especially close relationship with UC Berkeley uh, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across many frontiers. And the motivation for our Midday Science Cafe series is to highlight those compelling and complementary scientific research uh, projects and initiatives that are coming out of both of our institutions. Uh, so with that, we hope you enjoy our Earth Day themed talk. 
about plastics. All right, Dee, back to you. Thank you. And I will take this time to introduce our very first speaker, Aaron Hall. He has the floor. He is the founder of Entropic Materials, where he is currently working to solve the plastic waste. Oh, you took over my screen, Aaron, so I couldn't read your bio. <laughs> the plastic waste problem from the inside out. He leverages a diverse set of professional experiences in consumer packaged goods, um, research and development, consulting, and financial management and strategy to guide his work. Hall earned his PhD in material science and engineering from UC Berkeley, Go Bears, where he led the design and development of the novel enzyme stabilizing polymers at the core of Entropic and a, and a bachelor's in science in chemistry from UC Santa Cruz. A Bay Area native and an avid cook, Hall draws inspiration from the innovation innovation culture of and waste not ethos of the kitchen. So welcome, Aaron, and go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction and for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about our work um, on solving the plastic waste problem from the inside out. So I hope we're all aware that plastic waste is really an enormous problem. Um, the scale of it is kind of baffling. Over 6.3 billion tons of plastic have ended up as waste, and, and that waste is polluting our land, our ocean, our air, and increasingly we're realizing even our bodies and those of our animal friends. Um, this ocean garbage patch covers more area than the state of Texas, which is really insane. Um, and, you know, in thinking about the end of life here, the goal is not to just eliminate plastic altogether. Plastic has a number of wonderful benefits that it brings to our modern society, keeping our food clean and our medical establishment running and our electronics and so many other wonderful things. Um, so really what we'd love to do is be able to have a better end of life while maintaining all of these wonderful benefits and not ruining our planet and ourselves in the process. And so one of the reasons why there is so much plastic waste is that it's frankly hard to get rid of. Uh, I think many of us have had this experience of trying to figure out which of the various bins we should be putting each type of waste and whether or not it's actually being recycled or going to the compost or is it just going to landfill and honestly even just making sense of what all these claims are on the packages right. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for greenwashing out there, which is really just kind of thinking about like marketing to eco conscious consumers, but maybe not carrying all the way through to the end. Uh, and if you think about plastic waste, one of the classic things that comes up is well, recycling, right? We should just be recycling more. Uh, and I think the reality is recycling isn't going to save us. Um, unfortunately, given how much waste we still have, it's pretty clear that, that recycling isn't saving us. Uh, and there's kind of a number of reasons for that. Uh, if we want to recycle something, that waste has to be sorted by the type of plastic, cleaned, ground up into powders, and then processed. And as you might imagine, that's a lot of work. Uh, second, the types of plastic that can actually be recycled, not just based on the label, but what actually gets recycled, varies greatly depending on where you are. Um, even city to city, things can change dramatically. Uh, and that's because the infrastructure is just not standardized. Uh, there's also the act of recycling plastic, which can degrade the quality of that plastic to begin with, which means we then need to add in new plastic or additives to keep them working. Uh, and so finally, you know, combining all this together with the realities of the economics here, um, a lot of plastic just ends up going to the landfill and becomes waste. And this is really indicative of a bigger problem. Um, the vast majority of our plastics are being derived from petroleum, which is a non-renewable resource, right? And, and we're seeing the effects of, of that in our society today, right? Uh, and we really have what is mostly a linear economy, which means that we're extracting resources and then basically sending them directly to the trash, which is really not a good way to, to sort of foster and, and care for our resources. Um, the recycling economy would give that material a couple more cycles, but it still ends up in the trash. What really would be a nicer goal, right, is to move to something like a circular economy, one where all the materials continue to exist within the system, getting reused and repurposed, rather than going in the trash at all. And what I think we're really gonna see increasingly more of, especially here in California, 
uh, is this idea of a circular bioeconomy. So we're going to take that idea of a circular economy of reusing these materials over and over, but take it one step further and get away from oil and instead source them from biological sources, right? From microbes, from plants, from bacteria. Um, and this is a really exciting opportunity for us to reimagine and, and re-envision how we uh, engage with our modern materials and chemical space. And so getting back to plastics, uh, compostable plastics are really the promise of bringing this circular bioeconomy to the world. We'll derive these from renewable plant sources, we'll turn them into plastic products that we use in our everyday life, and then at the end of life we'll compost them and return them back to the soil. You've likely come across some of these products in your day-to-day, -day. Uh, the compostable cups and cutlery at restaurants or maybe green bags uh, at the grocery store or in your compost bin, so they're out there. Now, I'm a chemist, and so I thought it would be appropriate to show you some chemical structures. I don't expect you all to memorize these and you will not be quizzed, uh, but I just wanted to show you a few of the names you might see out there, things like PLA, PHA, or PBS, and to also appreciate that there are large multinational companies getting involved in this space, as well as lots of very exciting startups, including in tropic materials. Now, this sounds great, right? We've got compostable plastic, we'll grow some plants, we'll make some plastic, but there's still growing pains that we're working through. These materials are still more expensive than the petroleum products. And I think that's gonna go away with scale, but it's gonna take a little bit of time, right? More importantly, most of these plastics require industrial composting to properly degrade, which is really quite rare. And as of yet is unavailable to most consumers. And so that means, and that's really required because these plastics don't degrade very quickly when they're left on their own. Now, if we could get that degradation to go faster, we'd make this whole process of closing the loop and returning back to the soil a lot easier. Now, enzymes are the solution. Enzymes make the chemistry happen in biology. They're these specific molecules that are found in cells and they help reactions go millions of times faster. Uh, they do all sorts of different kinds of chemistry and of particular interest here, they break down plastics. So great, let's use those. Unfortunately, enzymes don't really like being outside of cells and the heat and chemical solvents and industrial processing that we would need to do this will ruin them. Now, if we think about what happens to a compostable plastic in nature, um, bacteria, yeast, other microbes land on the surface and they start to cut the plastic chains up. Now, this cutting process happens in a pretty haphazard and inefficient way which means that not only is this degradation slow, which I already touched on earlier, but it also risks forming microplastics if we don't let it go long enough. Now, what if, this is the question that we asked, is what if we could degrade them from the inside out? Right? I already told you that enzymes are capable of doing this, um, but if we could put these enzymes inside the plastic somehow, we would then have a solution built in from the beginning. Then we could degrade very fast, very efficiently, and most importantly, also not leave behind any microplastics. Now, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that enzymes are pretty temperamental and putting them inside of a plastic is a really big ask. So we had to come up with a way to keep them held together and comfortable through that industrial processing process. Uh, and so we designed a stabilizer that could wrap around them and protect them from the harsh environment. And this is really the key secret sauce that, that we put together. And if you're interested in this, please go check out our papers or, or reach out and, and learn more. I'd be happy to talk in more detail. In essence, what we did is we looked at the surfaces of the enzymes and we realized that there was a pattern of different kinds of chemical interactions on the surface there. So some of these patches like water, some of them hate water, some of them have positive charges, some of them have negative charges. And so what we did was we designed a coating that matched that pattern. And that worked very, very well. And what this allowed us to do is embed the stabilized enzymes directly inside the plastics and overcome their challenges with stability. So here on the left, I'm showing a plastic film and in the middle, some plastic fibers, both of which have enzymes inside and were processed using chemical solvents and or heat. Uh, and on the right is a microscope image showing how we were able to get these enzymes to dissolve very uniformly in the plastic. And we used a fluorescent tag to make it glow green so that we could actually see it because the enzymes are so small, we wouldn't be able to see them otherwise. This let us overcome those challenges. 
around stability. And so getting back to our initial goal of putting the enzymes in the plastics and hoping that they could then self-degrade, uh, we expose them to either warm water baths or compost to model environments that we could think about for degrading these materials. Uh, and we achieved rapid and complete breakdown of these plastics into small molecules that can be either composted or recaptured and reused for a nice circular model. And this all happened up to 98% faster than the conventional plastics. So in summary, plastic waste is a huge global crisis that we should all be giving some thought to. And compostable plastics may offer us a path to a soil to soil life cycle, but that degradation is still a bit slow. And by putting enzymes inside the plastics, we were able to help break them down much, much faster. Uh, and the way that we did this is using an enzyme stabilizing technology that we developed while I was at Berkeley. And this opens the path to having our plastics break down as easily as leaves do. Now, of course, with any scientific talk, there's always next steps. And so for us, it's really thinking about optimizing the formulations, scaling up the production to more commercially relevant scales, and of course, testing the materials in various compost sites around the country to make sure that we're fully delivering. And then as always, iterating to make improvements over time. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and to highlight that this work was not done by me alone. They say teamwork makes the dream work and that certainly applies here. I'm highlighting just a few of the critical team members here, particularly Professor Ting Shu, whose lab I was in, uh, and my colleague, Dr. Chris Del Rey, who really led the majority of the work around the actual enzyme degradation piece. Uh, and then of course, all of the numerous agencies and organizations that have continued to support our research development, and now the commercialization of this work with entropic materials. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Aaron. I learned so much. So let's just do a few questions before we head into Jeremy's talk. So how do we actually activate the enzyme to break down the plastic? How does that work? Yeah, that's a really great question. So right now we get activation with both water and heat. So it's not just enough to have one or the other. You do need both. And when I say heat, we're talking about something between 40 to 60 degrees Celsius. So that's hot, but it's not so hot that it becomes impractical. Uh, and those are temperatures that you might find actually inside of a compost. So we're well within the window of where we would need to be. Thanks. So sorry. You know what? I just got a text from D. Her computer has crashed on her. So I'm actually going to take over questions <laughs> while she brings her, her system back up. So one of the questions that we got from a couple of viewers is, you know, how, how can you prevent the premature breakdown of some of these compostable plastics while they're in use? Is that a problem? And how is that addressed? Yeah, that's a really great question. So what we've seen is that simply being exposed to water or to heat alone is not enough to actually get activation. You really need both of those two in tandem. Uh, and that's really important because obviously we don't want products degrading on the shelf and degrading, um, you know, we don't want to cover our, our shelves with syrups and sticky things and, and all of that. The other piece that I'll highlight is that um, some of the applications where this could potentially be a problem, right? You might think like a plastic water bottle. Um, a lot of those liquid containing items are made out of PET. And I, I kind of hammered a little bit on the recycling side at the beginning, but PET is actually one of our big wins in the recycling space. We actually can recycle that material fairly effectively and a lot of it does get recycled. And so we're not targeting that particular area at the front end either because we don't want to blow up some of the things that work here, right? This is ultimately focused on bringing more sustainable options. And so there's a lot of applications where we really, really wouldn't be worried about that on the shelf. Got it. Thanks so much, Erin. I'm glad the, the people who asked that question asked because I was curious about that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, well, we will have you um, Stop sharing your screen while I introduce our next speaker. We'll bring you back for the Q&A at the end, but it is now my pleasure to invite our next speaker to the screen, Dr. Jeremy uh, 
Dimato. So Jeremy is a project scientist at Berkeley Lab, where he is currently focused on the formation of circular plastics that can be easily deconstructed under certain conditions, which provides a very promising alternative to commodity plastics. Now, prior to joining the lab, Jeremy, who was a recipient of a WBI International Research Fellowship, was a postdoctoral researcher with the Innovative Polymers Group of Polymat in San Sebastian, Spain, where he worked on the chemical recycling of commodity plastics. And he earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in chemistry from the University of Liege in Belgium. And in his spare time, Jeremy is a fan of hiking in these beautiful East Bay Hills. He loves to cook, and he also loves to play and watch basketball. So with that, Jeremy, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you, Jen. It's a great pleasure to be here at the Midday Science Cafe. So um, today I'm going to talk about our circular uh, polymers, plastics. Uh, I'm going to talk first about recycling, then a little bit about sustainability, and finally bio-renewability. And first, I like to start my talk with a picture of, of the issue that we are all facing these days, plastic pollution. As you, as you probably know, microplastics now contaminates the entire planet, as Aaron just said before. We have traces of plastics from the deepest part of our oceans to the summit of Mount Everest, which means pollution is not only transported in the water, but also through air. Recently, scientists even found uh, particles of plastics in human lungs, liver, and blood streams in almost a the sample they have analyzed. And here is a sentence from Laura Parker from National Geog Geographic that I really like. We made plastic, we depend on it, but now we are drowning in it. Um, here is a representation of the, the plastic problem. Uh, as most of you know, plastics are majorly made from petrol. And then we turn them into resin, finally transform them into the desired products such as plastic bottles, fabrics, electronics, and so on. But currently, the vast majority of plastic waste go to landfills. This is 40%, and incineration, this is 25%. Around 19% of these wastes are actually dumped into the environment still, and only 15% of them are recycled. And here, I'm going to make the difference between mechanical and chemical recycling. So first, mechanical recycling means that plastic waste are usually melted with other plastics into a new material, such as this t-shirt, and whose characteristic have degraded all along the way, which only delays the problem of plastic, solution, of plastic pollution, because we cannot reprocess them once they are melted with other plastics. But with chemical recycling, which only represents 1% right now, you can break down the materials and reprocess it infinitely, over and over and over. And in reality, very few plastics can be efficiently recycled and chemically recycled. And this is probably one of the biggest controversy from the plastic industry who made people believe that all plastics were recyclable and recycled with this um, circular sign. But currently only uh, polyethylene tereftalate and polystyrene here that you can find, for example, in styrofoams can be efficiently chemically recycled. And I would like to, to sh I would love to show you a graph of this uh, time evolution on the x axis um, and the plastic pollution here in million tons per year on the y axis. And currently, right now, what we have is a ratio of one to five of plastics um, to fish in our oceans in terms of weight. And if we continue um, our current way of treating plastic waste, this is the red curve here. Um, we are going to end up to having, having more plastics in our ocean than fish. On the other end here, if uh, we use more and more chemical recycling, this is the system change scenario in purple here. We're going to end up having a, a ratio uh, below this one to five. And um, 
Currently, industry practices about polymer recycling is changing. And we do see now small companies and also big industrials such as Ineos, Indorama, or Sabic that are getting into this circular economy um, system, as Aaron just mentioned, but more specifically into the chemical recycling of plastic. And for example, recently IBM with this Volcat uh, catalyst system um, used PET bottles, they break it into small parts and then introduce them into uh, this reactor. And after some treatment, they were able to recover this very thin white powder that is the primary building block of your PET bottle here. And in our lab here in uh, Berkeley lab, we are focusing on the, the formation of new circular plastics that are called polydiketoinamine or PDK. And essentially what we do is we combine these green dot with um, these um, purple uh, circle here to form what we call this PDK resin. This is the, the chemical formal, formula of our PDK resin here. And after um, an acid process here that you see on this little video, we can essentially deconstruct these green and purple dots and recover them in a very high yield and very high purity. You will maybe notice that this acid process has been done at room temperature, so it's very low energy intensive. And as we recover the two primary building block here, this is a fully circular system. And here, I would like to show you what we uh, actually did in the lab. So we mix different plastic waste here, coming from, for example, fishing net, nylon, but also plastic bottle here from PET and plastic bag coming from polyethylene. And we mix them together with our uh, PDK, so circular plastic. Essentially, we, we use an acid process to selectively recycle our PDK while the other remain totally untouched. And after separation and recovery uh, steps here, we essentially here solubilize our um, building block and finally recover it in a virgin-like um, uh, fashion here, uh, our uh, white powder uh, that can be at the end recombined to close the loop and reform our circular PDK. And more recently, we have developed what is called the system analysis that um, essentially involve engineering design and cash flow analysis. It's a close collaboration between uh, the chemistry team and the engineering team here. And as we always start from, from the lab with a new synthesis, they help us um, to understand a little bit better what was the cost and the CO2 emission of our process to optimize it. And the main takeaway from that study is, is this one. So um, when we introduce our uh, PDK, our circular plastics, into this uh, secondary manufacturing, into the loop, um, we found out that it was very green and at low cost. But when we look at the primary resin production here, it was still very emissive in terms of CO2 and also quite expensive. So with more uh, collaboration here, we uh, were able to, to see a reduction of 66% uh, uh, CO2 emission and also a, a decrease of 57% of the cost here. And from there, we have analyzed our circular PDK and we compare them with other commodity plastics, such as drinkable bottle made of PET, detergent bottles from HDPE and soft mattresses uh, made of polyurethane. And these are the results of, of that study. So essentially, in terms of CO2 emission, so kilogram of CO2 per kilogram of plastics, uh, our circular PDK were doing a pretty good job compared to, to the three others. Um, and on the other end, in terms of costs, so when we introduced our PDK in this loop, um, uh, our uh, circular PDK here were also quite competitive regarding uh, HGPE and PET, while uh, far ahead uh, uh, of, these, of these polyurethane soft mattresses. So just the main takeaway of that study, um, 
when we compare our PDK with others, um, this is the champion. So we, we end up at the first position in terms of CO2 emission, while in terms of cost, we were also competing PET and uh, HGPE. And finally, I would like to, to uh, finish this talk with um, the biorenewability. So in biorenewability, you have bio coming from biomass and renewability coming from renewable resource uh, in opposition with a fossil resource. And today we are um, actually using mainly um, fossil resource to create and synthesize our building blocks that we use them in polymerization to create our plastics. And then after processing here, we recycle them in acid as I've shown before. But in the future, we are envisioning to use biomass and biomass waste to feed our um, to feed microorganisms that will be uh, genetically modified here and to serve that as a feedstock for building our uh, monomers, our building blocks that can be used to create our plastics. And depending how we genetically modify these microorganisms, we'll be able to, to target different type of application and different type of properties, such as more flexible uh, plastics or um, more uh, st or stiffer materials. And with that, I would like to uh, thank all of our collaborators, the computational team, as well as the engineering team and the biochemist that we are collaborating with, our funding program from the uh, Department of Energy, um, and of course, the Midday Science Cafe team that organized that very nice talk. And thank you all for your attention. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jeremy. That was a great presentation. Uh, so we have a couple questions for you before we bring Dee and Aaron back. And the first is, uh, you know, it seems like mechanical recycling where, you know, certain kinds of plastics are ground down and then melted is still the main way that plastics are recycled today. So I've got a two part question for you. Why isn't chemical recycling more prevalent? Um, and then specifically with regard to PDK recycling using acids, could that acid also be recycled? Or does that become a separate source of you know, chemical waste? Yeah, it's actually a great question. So um, I'm going to come back to, to this slide here. Uh, and that's, I would say, the, the main novelty of our PDK. Um, as I mentioned here, we are using a, an acid process, which is done uh, mainly at room temperature for most of our formulation which means that it's very low energy intensive. And um, if you compare that, for example, with current technology um, done with, uh, for example, PET, uh, most of the process right now are done at, at quite high temperature uh, or high pressure, which means that um, in terms of energy, it's, there is a, a huge gap between our technology and, and uh, industrial uh, one. Got it. Thanks so much. Um, and so another question I'll, I'll sort of refer to you is, you know, could could this plastic that you're developing be used to replace traditional plastics in a variety of consumer products? And I'm thinking everything from water bottles to take out containers to, you know, maybe car parts and even furniture. Yep. Uh, actually, right now we are um, targeting one, one specific market and we are um, actually trying to replace one specific market being the polyurethane one as the, the different um, component of the, the chemistry here that we are using is very similar to, to the polyurethane one. Um, we, we are trying to compete uh, that specific market and more specifically, um, we are also trying to replace some parts of, for example, the automotive sector such as uh, mattresses that are found, uh, so more on the, on the soft part of the, the materials, but also the more um, uh, rigid part um, of, of our cars. So it's very, um, the automotive sector is, is a very interesting one as, as um, uh, you can probably quickly recover the, the material um, and, and also control the, the end of life of these material at the, at, at the very end, while also you can find some value from, from these wastes as well. 
Fantastic. Thanks so much. All right. I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen and I'm going to invite Dee and Aaron to join us. And as they're getting their computers turned on, I have a question that I think I'd be interested in hearing from both Aaron and Jeremy about. So, you know, these these truly recyclable and compostable plastics are, are, are exciting. You know, um, they're, I think, uh, something that are much, much needed. But when might we actually see these products on the market? You know, what is your what is your scale up process look like? Um, and maybe Aaron, I'll have you answer first. Sure. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, so, you know, in, in transitioning from being a PhD researcher, where really we're just, I mean, we're trying to do work that supports and builds up society, but we're also just trying to explore our curiosities and really drive our understanding of science and, and generate new things to being in a business context where we're really trying to bring things to the market. And so this idea of scale up has been very front of mind for me. Um, the strategy I'm using right now is to try to leverage as much commercially available um, infrastructure as well as um, components as possible so that we can move quickly. Um, what's nice is the way that this works is very much like an additive. So we don't need to make, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons of our material in order to actually start testing. We can make more like kilograms or a few kilograms, maybe tens of kilograms. Um, so hopefully by, by end of year or maybe uh, into sort of the middle of next year, we should be at a place where we can start actually running some samples and putting things in people's hands and actually testing them. Uh, and then getting, of course, all of the, the proper assessments and validations and things we'll need to do to actually enter the market. Super exciting. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Jeremy, what about you? Yeah, <clears throat> on our end, I think we are, um, I would say, uh, at the very early stage of, of this research. So um, we are going to, to start the, the, the started process within the next few months, but um, so far, uh, I think we are still on the on the lab uh, stage, and and we are uh, yeah envis envisioning um, a commercialization probably uh, in in the next I would say uh, uh, three to four years, uh, but but not not before that. Yeah. Got it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, maybe one more question for uh, for the two of you, and then I'll turn things over to Dee. Um, so somebody asked or observed that the circular recycling model is is pretty exciting, but does this not mean that the plastic pollution we have will remain as pollution? And I think specifically they they're talking about you know microplastic and nanoplastic pollution, which seems to be you know, like a relatively recent issue. So what can we do to collect um, and, and sort of address the, the existing sort of plastic pollution problem that we might have? And I don't know if uh, one of you, I'll, I'll, I'll let you decide if <laughs> somebody wants to go first there. Or I'll, I'll start. Um, it's a really hard problem. It's an incredibly hard problem. Um, even dealing with the plastic waste that is not microplastics or nanoplastics, right, but just these large items is still a really big challenge. Um, now, that being said, I think there's some exciting things happening in the space. Um, there's a lot of new, very cool robotics technology and computer vision technology that might be able to help us more effectively or rapidly sort plastics and plastic waste. Um, I think going forward, landfills might actually become sources of natural resources that we'll turn back to and start mining things out of there because there's just a lot of value that's sitting uh, idle there. I think with, with microplastics and nanoplastics, we're still learning more about you know, how prevalent these materials are, what kinds of effects they have on, on natural systems, um, and, and you know, technologies being worked on, I think, to try to address these challenges, but they're very tough. And so, you know, as is often the case, you know, we want to really get to the root of where the source is coming from to at least try to curb um, that, that problem, right? And so if we can move to better materials at the front end, I think that'll help um, and at least stop the growing amount, right? And then how we deal with what's already there is still an ongoing uh, consideration. It's probably some combination of public and private um, and global uh, alliance, right, to actually bring these solutions and bring these technologies uh, to address these challenges. Yep, if I can add something to, to uh, what Aaron just 
said, um, right now, I think we are uh, seeing like sort of a, a shift from industrial, basically um, like they are realizing that uh, our waste that we produce have value actually. Uh, even if right now, um, most of the costs for producing uh, virgin like plastics is still um, way below coming from petroleum resources. They are uh, actually like realizing right now that that it's a, uh, it's also coming from from the waste can be like um, a, a great thing not only uh, in terms of the environment, but also in terms of economics, and and from uh, the different technologies that uh, are currently increasing increasing for example uh, barcoding uh, our uh, current waste could be something that can definitely improve the, the way we, we sort plastic and the way we, we recycle them. Um, and I believe in the future, it's, it's something that's going to be only uh, increased. Um, that, that's, that's only going to increase uh, yeah, with, with that, that barcoding system uh, of our uh, waste. Great, Aaron. I have a two part question for you. Um, somebody asks economically, what's the difference between these plastics and conventional compostable plastics? And then the second part is, are you expecting your new plastics to end up in compostable waste as well? Yes, that's a, a great question. So we will function like an additive into the existing uh, compostable plastics. And I, I, the way to think about that or why that matters is uh, a few things, right? So one, it augments and helps improve the end of life considerations for those existing plastics, right? So those existing compostable plastics that we are not as, e are not as easily composted right now, um, those will now have an easier path uh, to being actually composted and returned to the soil. It also is really interesting because it eliminates this tension, which, Right now, if you have a compostable plastic product, you have to validate that that product actually breaks down according to a certain set of standards, which means that you're sort of in a tension if you're a product designer, because you're designing this thing to be robust and mechanically stable and, you know, it's got the best properties ever. And when I'm done with you, you disappear as fast as possible. Right. And that's a really hard thing to do at the same time. That's two very different asks of a material. And what putting the enzymes inside does is enables us to have sort of a, a switch on the side where we can say at the end of life, flip, and now it breaks down very rapidly. Um, and so we don't need a lot of that material to go in there. We're looking at very, very low percentage usage levels, which means that it should have a minimal impact um, on the cost of these plastics, which should hopefully make it much more economically viable. And also, since we use very little, we don't need to build a lot of new infrastructure to manufacture this, right? So it's not bringing a whole new material to the market, it's augmenting what's already out there. Great, okay. So that that actually, that answer both of those questions then. <laughs> um, and so are these materials non-toxic? So if a child swallowed a piece of the plastic, would the enzyme potentially activate? And if yes, Yes, so if they did, would that be toxic if the enzyme was activated? I mean, not that we want children swallowing plastics anyways, but I understand the point of the question. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so these enzymes, the, the types of enzymes that break down these plastics, they're found in nature already. They're already within our bodies. They break down fats. They break down other molecules that have similar kinds of structures, not necessarily plastics, but um, you know other kinds of chemistry. And so... Um, we will be validating this and, and we have some collaborations in place right now looking into this further to really get, you know, really definitive data as much as possible. Um, but we eat proteins, we eat enzymes, they're in our foods, they're in, you know, our laundry detergents, they're in, in our bodies naturally, um, they're in leaves, right? And so this is not some totally new structure that's never been seen before. Um, and that's actually part of the inspiration for the work, right, is that nature uses proteins and proteins can readily fall apart um, with, with certain you know, other features that, that nature has, right? They have tools for cutting them apart. And so I think we should be pretty good on that front, but we'll be validating it, of course, because that's the responsible thing to do. 
Awesome. So I want to bounce back to Jeremy for a couple questions. And I think um, there are a few folks in the audience who are, are looking for a little bit more clarity about the, uh, the asset process for PDK. So can you talk a little bit more about um, whether, you know, you're able to recycle that asset? You know, how much is generated? How much is disposed? I think people are curious to learn a little bit more about that aspect of PDK. Yeah, sure. So usually what we do in the lab, so we, we dump our um, plastic uh, pieces of um, yeah our piece of plastic in into acid in a, an excess of acid and after a couple of hours usually what we see is a de deconstruction of this this solid piece into a very thin powder uh, and um, the way we recover our monomer uh, our building block is usually by filtration simple filtration um, and at the bottom, so we, we have our acid with usually the other building block, the, the amine. And, and the way we reprocess, uh, we recover the amine is usually with an ion exchange resin. It, it might be a little bit technical, but, but essentially um, at, at, the, at the end of the process, we can, we can actually recover this, this acid and reuse it over and over. So, so that again closed the loop of, of this reagent uh, that, that is used like in excess in our process. So uh, of course that, that decreased the cost and the environmental impact as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Um, I'm going to ask another question, uh, I think to you, but maybe Aaron might have some, uh, something to say on this as well. So, you know, we, we've heard that you know, beyond the number one and number two plastics, everything else is a little hard to, to recycle. So can you talk a little bit about how, you know, other additives like pigments challenge the recycling and compostability of plastics? Yeah, I think I can start. Um, we have uh, actually demonstrated with our system specifically that by incorporation of uh, pigments, additives, fillers uh, um, in our formulation, so in the solid, uh, pieces of plastic, we can, with that acid process, um, separate them uh, from uh, our, our building block. And, and so, um, again, by simple filtration, at the moment, we solubilize it, uh, our monomer, we, we, we filtrate that either on a membrane or a paper filter, depending on, on the filler or the additive that we use or the, the pigment also. Um, at, at the very end to recover that, that pristine uh, monomer. Um, so additives uh, is, is not an issue for us. Um, and and I, will, I will give uh, the word to, to Aaron now. Sure, yeah. So I think when we think about having additives in the compostable plastics, right? Like the, the classic one that maybe most of us are familiar with is that clear plastic cup with the green band around it, right? So if we have that um, enzyme inside and we degrade in a warm water bath, it's gonna leak out that green dye and we would be able potentially to uh, collect it. Now, in order to get these products as certified to be compostable, then the pigments and the other components that are in there also need to fall within the spec of being biodegradable and compostable. So there's less concern about the additives um, in that state, but because we can also basically do this chemical recycling type approach, if we did it in a tank, there's the option to collect the monomers in a very similar kind of way to what's being done with Jeremy's PDK work. Um, and we could in theory collect the, the dyes out as well. Um, the other thing I'll highlight there with additives is that that's also just one of the big challenges with recycling is that even if you collect a bunch of plastic and you clean and sort and grind it up, Oftentimes, you don't end up with a nice, pretty clear material at the end. You'll end up with some sort of muddled gray, you know, mix of all the crayons kind of situation going on. And that can be a big challenge for um, finding a market where people are willing to take that because, of course, the marketers and, you know, everybody wants to have nice, pretty things on the shelf that are clear and show off the wonderful products inside. So that's also a challenge that um, needs to be addressed, right? And, and frankly, that's there's a lot of problems to solve in this space. So uh, it's, it's an exciting time to be in plastic. 
Definitely. Thanks both. Um, I'm going to ask one more question for, for Jeremy, and then I'm going to hand things back over to Dee. So somebody noticed that with your PDK strategy, um, you know, it works for HDPE, but uh, you didn't talk necessarily about LDPE. So is there a large chemical difference between HDPE and LDPE? So um, in terms of, of the structure of the, the crystallinity mainly of HDPE, uh, it's much higher. Uh, and on the on the chemical level, uh, essentially, uh, what you see with uh, HDPE is like very linear chains, while um, for LDPE, what you will see is like linear with like some segment going up and 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 down. That's that's the chemical explanation of of the the difference between um, LDPE and HDPE, and and the crystallinity essentially. Uh, makes the, the property of the material very different. So you will find, for example, um, plastic bags very flexible uh, with uh, LDPE, while um, for a HDPE that has a more crystalline domain, you will, you will have uh, something much more rigid that you can find, for example, in, in the detergent uh, bottles. Yeah. Great. Okay, so there are some questions that have to do with bins, of course, um, where to put things in which bins and the confusion around that. So I'll just do a little bit um, in that kind of sphere and you can both um, chime in if you have answers. But, you know, somebody mentioned that right now, um, well, they're curious if these compostables with enzymes have been addressed with the commercial composting companies meaning are they on board to accept them within their green bins because even some counties don't even accept compostable items in their green bins currently instead you know customers are told to put them in the trash um so there's some questions around around if you've spoken with the companies around actually um, putting them in the green bins and if that's going to be allowed yeah, definitely. That's uh, that's a huge issue, right? It's one of the things where compostable plastics are not always closing that loop, right, of being composted. And that the, the driver for that, for them not being accepted, um, there's a number of different drivers, right? Some composters just philosophically don't want to put plastic in their bin, regardless of, of you know, what has been shown in a lab or not, right? That's just not where they're at. There's other composters who would be excited to do so, but it just doesn't work with their system. It either takes too long or it doesn't break down all the way, or there's too much fouling or there's too much, you know, not compostable stuff getting in. Um, and so I have a lot of empathy for that because these businesses are moving on speed and they're really trying to deliver high quality compost products out to the market, right? And to deal with all this plastic. Uh, in addition to that can be tough. And so to sort of get directly to that, um, we have, in our collaborations with some of the folks up at LBL, um, started some conversations around this. The pandemic has slowed down some of that experimentation, but that's absolutely part of this. Um, and kind of to that end, we've spoken with the Compost Manufacturers Alliance, which they represent a lot of the composters. We've spoken with some folks um, at, here in California, some of the different waste uh, management folks, and it, it's certainly part of the strategy to talk to and find out the voice of those players because we need to make sure that we're hitting every single part of that ecosystem from the resin you know polymer manufacturing side all the way through to those who are actually dealing with this at the end of the cycle and making sure it works throughout the process yeah i really like this next question too in the same kind of vein um this person says First, this person says, Aaron, as you mentioned, a lot of people get so confused about plastic recycling. For example, what's recyclable, what isn't, what actually happens after you put it in the bin. Um, do you have any advice right now before truly recyclable and compostable plastics hit, hit the market for people really trying to be mindful about the materials that they use in their lives? This question goes to both of you about how do we together as a community be sort of more mindful altogether, what's the right path forward? What would you suggest as scientists working in this space? Yeah, um, there's a few things I think you can do as a consumer right now that can help. So the first is to uh, reduce, frankly, right? Make conscious decisions to avoid packaging 
um, unnecessary plastics, unnecessary consumption when you can. Um, that takes time, that takes effort, that's hard. I empathize with it, I deal with it too, right? And I'm working on this and I care about it. Um, but reducing is certainly the first thing that you can do. Um, the second is getting well informed about the places where you are and what's accepted and not accepted in your bins. Um, and, and that really have to dig in because if you work in a different city or a different county, that might be different, right? It might change place to place. And so getting educated and making sure you're putting things in the correct bins um, becoming politically active. There's a lot of really interesting legislation that's being pushed um, both here in California as well as globally and, and nationally. And so getting involved and letting your voice be heard um, is certainly there. And I think also um, using your dollar, right? So when you can buy things that are made from recycled components, when you can buy things in compostable packaging, um, you know, and really letting your voice be heard by the the brands out there that, hey, I care about this issue and I wanna see it get addressed. Um, those are all things I think that will definitely help drive to getting things in the right place. And then finally, just having a bit of empathy and grace for yourself. Like the vast majority of us did not pick what kind of material all of the things that we buy are going, you know, being packaged in and we don't have a say for everything. And so do your best and um, to just try to be mindful of it and caring in the first place uh, is the first step. So I, I really encourage that and appreciate it. Yeah, if I can add something to what just Aaron uh, just said, um, of course, uh, reduce is, is, the, is the first, I would say, uh, thing I have in mind. Uh, reduce the single uh, use packaging first uh, as, much, as much as you can. Um, as you probably know, the, the single use packaging there uh, like lifetime is super short and so if you can like um, instead use reusable items uh, instead of, of these and also just make different choices in your everyday life as just Aaron said uh, it takes effort to 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 do that but um, essentially like going to your gro grocery store and and pick certain items that are not uh, like packed in a, in a single use packaging is makes a makes a small difference but i think it's a small effort that that can make uh, i think a difference um and and other than that yeah re reuse uh, reduce and reuse is also like another uh, mantra here for uh, sustainability in terms of plastic so reuse uh, as much as you have uh, your uh, current plastics uh, instead of um instead of throwing them and and buy new ones yeah so both of you mentioned the importance of circular economies as it relates to plastics um is it actually possible to phase out all single-use plastics in the near future Aaron, i'm seeing you shake your head yes that's encouraging to hear although i'm wondering if that comes with maybe a little asterisk <laughs> yeah it's um it's hard. I, I think, um, you know, physics says like the ball rolls down the hill, right? Um, path of least resistance and single use plastics are really easy. Um, and so I am unsure whether we'll see a future where there is no more single use plastic in the sense that everything's in a reusable container and all that. I also don't know if that's the most sustainable world, frankly, but I think there absolutely is a very exciting and promising future where even those products that only have one use can enter back into the system and be reused again, maybe through chemical recycling, maybe through upcycling, um, maybe through composting, right? Um, lots of cool different approaches there. Um, but I think we can absolutely get out of this take make waste um, kind of model where we're just sending things to the trash and extracting and extracting and not having it go back into the system. I think there's absolutely uh, a push for there. There's a lot of excitement there. There's a lot of wonderful science and technology that's being developed and to be developed for that. And so uh, I wouldn't be on this journey if I didn't believe that. And I think the same can be said for many others in this space. Yep. I think a political decision will also help in that direction for sure. Um, like I've seen recently, I think was last week, um, the, the Spain government is gonna tax the single use plastic like by 
next year. Uh, and I think it's quite huge, like it's about uh, around 50 cents per kilogram of plastics, which is quite huge. If you remember like the scale, uh, the, the graph bar that I just show for HTPE, for example, uh, or, or PET, um, it's, it's quite uh, huge in that, in that area. So I believe that, that politics can, can also help in that direction for reducing our single use packaging just you know the cost matters right definitely um so this next question i think maybe actually gets at this previous question which is you know it seems that you know for the technologies that you both are talking about to be scalable um you know the plastics would need to be collected so that they can be treated differently than traditionally collected plastics so you know this does seem like one of the more problematic parts of our current recycling system have either of you, you know, as you're developing your new sort of plastics, um, as you're scaling, thought about how that would impact the current system? Uh, I've given some thought to this, and it, it is still a challenge. Um, so right now, you know, to give an example, right, if you put a compostable plastic cup into a recycling stream, and that recycler doesn't process say, let's just say it's PLA, right? They don't recycle PLA. Oftentimes that material is then being sent to a landfill um, because it would be a contaminant or they don't process it, right? And um, you know, someone in the, the chat highlighted, you know, Berkeley looking at number one and number two as being recyclable, right? And sort of how those dynamics have changed. Um, and so one of the things I think that, that comes out of this is that um, through policy change, as well as through just the availability of innovation and really being able to prove things out is, you know, what if all of our food streams were compostable, right? We want to be sending as much food as possible to compost. We want to replenish our soils. It's the right thing to be doing for a you know, huge myriad of reasons. Well, it, it's sort of a no brainer that any plastic being used in that space should be compostable because then you can send that with it and it just streamlines the process there. Um, so I think some of this is going to come from individual consumer level uh, attention and detail. And a lot of this is going to have to come from policy and or just uh, industrial innovation and, and optimization approaches. And so um, it's still going to be really hard for a while. Uh, and infrastructure is slow to change because it's expensive and uh, it's complex, right? All of these systems are really complex. And so um, to the best of our ability, we're trying to address that. In a, in a sort of holistic way um, with being able to send these materials into the compost and have them degrade. And if they go to a recycling plant and the recycler is interested in degrading, they could use a warm water bath to degrade. And then that creates a secondary stream of um, monomer that they could then sell back into the market, um, which is exciting, right? And warm water bath is a pretty simple uh, piece of infrastructure. So that, that's how it works for at least our side of it. So a next question for both of you, um, what would in an ideal world, ideal successful scenario look like for both of you? So for instance, would consumers be able to upcycle their waste in their own backyard and deposit upcycled materials into some sort of central bank? Or would all kinds of um, plastics be made from PDK, Jeremy? Um, so I'd like you, we'd like you both to answer this question. So for in, in our case, which is very different from, from Aaron, of course, we, we don't want our final product to be uh, dumped into the environment or um, in, in landfills or anything. So the, the, the way we are envisioning our, our products would be that we will recover ourselves our uh, our product so so that we can find also value in these in these products and and as i've uh, showed before um the when you introduce these pdk in the loop um the the process is even uh, cheaper and cheaper for us but also still keeping a very high quality of our material uh, which is also i think very important uh, in terms of, of the economics of, of your, your company, uh, as, as you will use the, the, feed, the feedstock as feedstock, um, the, the product of the consumers, right? Um, 
and and so yes the, the idea is here to to recover our our products in, in order to 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 reuse them um, and and recycle them in our own facilities yep yeah i would love to see as many of these products that are ending up in landfill right now um, that just don't have an economic incentive for us to be capturing them right now, right? We're, there's so many products, right? There's little thin plastic films. There's a lot of items that are too small to be recycled. So there's actually size limitations around what gets recycled because they screen things out. Um, you know, lots and lots of food and food related applications and lots of plastics are just too dirty with you know, either sticky or salty or, you know, whatever kinds of food waste that are on there. So all of that, I think we could be moving toward um, compostable. And what's nice is that, at least with our system, we can get compostability in soil, right? So we can return them back to farms and move more toward that circular bioeconomy kind of idea. Or if that's unavailable for whatever reason, right, there isn't compost in the area or, or whatnot, we can get that same kind of degradation in a water bath and those monomers that these plastics have broken down into can be recaptured and resold into the system um, to be turned back into fresh quality plastic. And uh, we actually did some proof of concept studies of that uh, in the paper that we published showing that we were able to, to get that, um, that material to be recovered and then reused. And so um, that I think would be a huge success here. Um, the other thing, and this kind of touches on a question someone else brought up earlier, but um, you know, we're starting with PLA as a first target, but we can really expand into a really wide variety of plastics over time. Um, there's lots of really amazing work in synthetic biology and, and in nature um, that has enzymes doing all sorts of wonderful chemistry. And so we can think about degrading lots of different kinds of plastics over time. Yeah, and speaking of PLA, there's actually another set of kind of questions around what happens when you bring these compostable plastics into sort of a recycling plant bed that maybe weren't meant to manage um, that type of, of um, polymer. So if it wasn't meant to degrade, you're introducing the enzyme um, and then somebody says PLA is not recyclable. So if PLA items are placed in recycling bins, you would contaminate the recycling process. So again, sort of questions around that. Do you have something to say as it relates to those questions? Sure. Yeah. So PLA is not recycled right now. It's not that it's not at all recyclable, but it's not typically recycled right now. Um, and that partially is due to the scale, right? There's just a lot less of it. And so it's hard, right? You're separating and collecting all this material. You have to clean it and sort it and grind it. And that gets very difficult. Um, and you really want to have clean streams. You want all PET in one stream and you want all HDPE in another stream. Um, and so, yeah, you don't want to contaminate and mix those plastics together because then there can be problems. Um, in terms of the enzyme part, uh, we really don't need to worry too much about that um, going into the stream any more than the PLA itself would be there because one, the usage level is very low. And two, by the time it's been clean, sorted, ground up, melted, all of this, um, it's very unlikely that at that point, the enzyme is going to actually be considered to be a real contaminant. Um, you know, there's already tons of enzymes and um, microbes and bacteria and yeast and everything else that's already on this plastic waste that's being recycled. So our little bit of stabilized enzyme in there isn't going to make a huge difference um, in, in terms of changing the way that it fouled that stream. Makes sense. I'll hand things back over to Jen. Thanks, Dee. Um, so, you know, in the process of developing these new plastics, how, and you, I, th I think you talked about this a little bit, I'm curious to hear a little bit more maybe, how are you gauging industry interest in adoption? Um, are, you, are you conducting market research at this stage of development? Yeah, I think I, I can start. Um, so as I, as I mentioned in the past uh, year, uh, we have been looking to the automotive sector. And so um, uh, that's like a very interesting sector for us. And uh, more specifically, we have been, we, we, we had like interviews with people, for example, coming from uh, Ford uh, or other, um, other um, yeah, industrials. 
uh, to know a little bit better about uh, the different uh, properties, notably of these, these mattress and how they, they are processing them and so on. Um, and and so the, the way the way we are envisioning right now our research is is first to develop our product and then uh, try try to match these these properties of, of the of the industrials yeah from the the automotive sector mainly yeah this is where i get to uh shamelessly plug some programs that i've been in that were truly wonderful so i did the um nsf i core the innovation core program at um, berkeley haas um, sort of early on right before the pandemic and our last class ended up being zoom after the shelter in place um, and then i actually did the national program chris and i did um, with with michelle um, our advisor our industry mentor uh, in the fall of 2020 and so that was this crazy sprint we we did uh, 100 customer discovery interviews in six, six weeks um, speaking with players all across the ecosystem and and since then um, i've continued to speak with lots of companies lots of corporates um, you know everyone from chemical manufacturers and additive manufacturers to uh, you know big brands small brands startups individuals who are excited i mean just the full gamut and um, it was really wonderful and I think an incredible complement to the scientific training. And so um, this is where I'll, I'll plug that any scientists out there that are excited about maybe starting a company, you should absolutely go do this. It will open your eyes and give you a lot more purpose in how you think about designing solutions that actually address the real problems that people are staying up late at night trying to figure out. So um, yeah, it's it's everything. That's what you have to do to get these things to work. You can't create solutions in a vacuum. Why true. Well, thank you, uh, Jeremy and Aaron. You know, there's a lot going on in the world these days, and hearing about your uh, you know advancement of these technologies gives me a lot of hope. I'm feeling optimistic, um, and you know, I I notice we are also close to 115. So that is going to bring us to the end of our event. So before we close, I do want to thank uh, Aaron and Jeremy one more time for their fantastic presentations, and thanks to our audience for tuning into our midday science cafes and asking so many fantastic questions. We really appreciate it. Um, I I don't. I can't remember if we mentioned this at the top end, we are actually going to be taking a break in May for Midday Science Cafe, but we'll be back in June for the next tranche of lectures. We've got some exciting <laughs> things to, to talk with you about. So we'll be announcing those topics very soon. Um, you know, And as always, if you wanna stay up to date on the research that's coming out of UC Berkeley or Berkeley Lab, you can visit Science at Cal at scienceatcal.berkeley.edu and Berkeley Lab is at lbl.gov. Thanks again to everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks Thank everyone, so another great season. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Take Thank care you. everyone. Thanks everybody, have a good afternoon.